Today we're talking about how to book and manage a live music event. Hey guys, Liam here for Pro Tips for Independent Bands. You might know us as the show that's just a little bit too honest about the music industry. Recently, we put up a video about how to find gigs from the perspective of a band, but today we're talking about how to actually put on an event from the perspective of a promoter. If you're considering putting on events yourself, then this is the video for you. This could also be really interesting to any musicians playing gigs, wanting to know a little bit more about what goes on behind the scenes, or for any bands who feel like they might want to manage their own events. There's plenty of interviews online where indie bands and some more established bands will completely slate promoters they've worked with, so it's no wonder that a lot of people don't want to manage events. Especially when you consider issues like pay to play, which is a big deal at the moment, and people just not wanting to appear as if they're ripping off hardworking musicians. So what we're going to do today is break this down into a step-by-step -step process that's easy to follow and take this horrifyingly daunting subject and make it not horrifyingly awkward. I could have written that better, couldn't I, really? Stab Panda actually started life as an events management group back in 2009, I think, and we've run all sorts of gigs from tiny pub gigs to big pub gigs to actual venues to running stages at music festivals. Some of them were successful, some of them were not successful, but that's how it goes. It's exciting, I guess. I can honestly say that the majority of issues we had were down to planning. If we had a resource like this video back in 2009, we would have been fine. We just needed someone telling us what to do, which we didn't have because YouTube was like four years old and there was nothing on it but cats. Does that change, actually? Without further ado, this is basically the order in which to do things when running a live music event. Some of these things will happen out of order, but that doesn't have to be a problem and there might be a little bit of variety with the way venues or bands choose to operate, but we'll try to account for those as we go. Firstly, you've got to find yourself a venue. Ideally, you're looking for something local with its own PA, with its own technician, and that is reasonably well known for hosting live music events. I'm hoping that if you've got an interest in running events, you have at least a vague idea of what venues are available to you. If you don't, maybe just try participating in your community, like, like a little, little, little bit. Just try harder. Once you've found a venue, you're gonna work out what dates are available. Usually venues will have some kind of gig calendar on their website. If not, you can phone them up or you can go there in person to talk to them. Be sure to give yourself a good few months to prepare for your event, especially if it's your first one. Once you've settled on a date, the venue might ask you to put down a non-refundable deposit, which is kind of fair enough, really. Just don't go canceling it. Find out what, if anything, they need from you to make sure this event happens and make sure that you find out the following. When do they open? When is the earliest that bands can start showing up? When do they close? Is there a point that they have to stop the music but they can keep the bar open after the gig? Is the room rental free or are you going to have to give them some money on the night? Does that room rental cover the cost of a live sound tech? What specific tech info will their sound tech require? and how far in advance will they need it. Lastly, find out if the venue has a strict 18 plus age restriction and whether or not it's your responsibility to police that. FYI, it should never be your responsibility to police that, but you can help out the venue in the way your event is promoted. We'll get onto that in the next episode when we talk about event promotion. Well done, you have just booked a venue. Now we've got to make sure there's actually something to put on that stage. When recruiting bands, you'll often start with your headliner, that is the biggest, most successful band, possibly the best sounding band as well, but that's not always the case. Start looking for bands either with Google or through sites like Reverb Nation where you can search for bands geographically. Once you've found a band in the style that you like, get in touch with them either via email or if you can't find their email address, ask them just informally over social media, over Twitter or Facebook, send them a message to the effect of, hi, I have a gig booked in August in Leicestershire, are you interested in playing? If so, can I have your email address? From there, you wanna work out what kind of payment they would require. It could be a flat fee, it could be a percentage of all money made or a percentage of all profit, 
or that if you're lucky they might just want you to cover travel or petrol costs. Now you want to find bands to support your headliner, which is essentially the same process, but the further down the list you go, your bands will probably get incrementally less popular or further away from your location of your venue. They would, ideally, all be playing the same or very similar styles of music. You might think, logically, that it makes sense to book, say, four different styles of music because you essentially quadruple your potential audience. Actually, the reality is that no one's going to want to pay a full entry price to see one band that they might enjoy. And if they did, chances are they wouldn't stick around for the entire event, so then you'd have a headliner playing to a three-quarters empty venue, which is a bit lame really. So like I say, try to keep it all within the same sphere of music. Your opening act should always be local. There's no point in bringing in entirely external bands. This is too much risk. So always make sure that at least your opening act is local, if not all the support acts. And please, please don't book acoustic versions of rock bands as the opening act, unless you're doing an acoustic rock EP, because it's just... It's cheap and it's easy, sure, but it's also really cringy. Please don't do that. If you struggle to find any bands, you could ask the ones you've already booked who they like or who they have previously enjoyed performing with. Or if they don't have any ideas, maybe you've got a friend who's into that style of music who goes to gigs or go to similar gigs to the one you're trying to put on and just steal all the bands from that one. I mean, not all the bands, but some of them. This is a list of stuff you need to cover with each band pretty early on. Tech Rider. What do bands need from you or the venue in terms of equipment? Usually venues will provide the PA, which is the big speakers that mean you hear everything, as well as all of the microphones. They might, if you're lucky, also have some amplifiers or a basic drum kit you can use. Is there any gear any of the bands are bringing that they're happy for other bands to use, like the majority of a drum kit, speakers or amplifiers? the big stuff that you really don't want to have to lug on and off the stage between every set. Your sound tech will usually need to know about the gear the bands are bringing so they can work out things like, does the bass amp have a direct line out or will they need to DI it or mic it? How big are the guitar amplifiers which could dictate what kind of microphone they use, if any? Uh, are there any keyboards? What kind of outputs do the keyboards have? What kind of drums are they bringing? Will they need microphones at all? That kind of thing. It will vary between each venue what information they actually need, so you should be prepared to provide all of it, just in case. Do the bands have any specific requests in terms of audio effects or lighting effects? So, should the first half of their set be entirely lit in blue, for example, or does a specific song require delay or a phaser on the vocal? That kind of thing. The fun stuff. Are any of the band members under 18 years of age and how will this work with your venue's 18 or not over 18 policy? It could just be as simple that that band member needs to bring a parent or guardian who stays with them at all times throughout the event. Work out the get-in times, which is literally when bands should show up and what time the technical runs are going to happen, because a band isn't just going to get up on a stage and automatically sound great they're actually going to have to work with the sound tech and run through a few songs to make sure they actually sound decent at all. You want to make sure there's plenty of time from when the bands turn up before the door opens to make sure that happens. Guest lists and tickets. Generally, I try to give bands a guest list so people in addition to the band who can come in, their guest list is the size of the band plus one. This allows each band member to bring a partner plus the band to bring a manager. Now, most bands at an indie level probably won't have a manager, but they'll probably appreciate the gesture. As for boyfriends and girlfriends, you might assume that you're risking losing money by just letting them in for free, but the reality is bands will often expect them to be let in for free by default. So by preempting this, you're going to avoid any awkward conversations like, ah, oh, come on, dude, just let them in. Be a bro or I don't know what bands say. Also, if you're sending them tickets in the post, it means you can cheekily send them a big pile of flyers as well. Those are all things that need to happen pretty early on, and you might learn down the line that some of them should actually be conditional. So work those things out before you even agree to hire a band for the night. Now, this is a list of the last logistical things to do, which don't necessarily have to happen early on, but shouldn't be left to the last minute. Timetable of the event. Basically, which band is on at what time and when do the doors open? 
make sure to account for things like the venue's closing time and opening time, the set length of each band, and any equipment that needs to be taken on or off stage in between the sets. Work out your entry price. Work out how much people are going to pay to get into your gig. The smart way to do this is by working out all of your outgoings first. So, how much does the venue or the sound tech need? How much are you spending on flyers, posters, digital promotion? How much do the bands want to be paid? And then how much money do you, the promoter, want to walk away with? Be realistic though. And also, if you're going to pay someone to sit on the door, add all of that up, that is your target income. Now you're going to take the venue's capacity. Let's say it's 150 people and you're going to half it. 75 people is your goal for how many people you want to get through the door on the night. Let's say hypothetically that your target income is £300. You're going to divide £300 by 75 people. That's £4. If 75 people pay £4 on the door on the night, you have made £300, which gets divided up however you've worked it out. Any more is a bonus. I would say at least aim for a half full venue. You can have a really good night with a half full venue. It's pretty hard to have a bad night for anyone with a half full venue. I would suggest at an indie level, if you're promoting events, but you've worked out that your ticket price is going to be £10 or more, you've worked out something wrong. And usually it's that you're expecting too much money in your pocket as the promoter or your headliner band is just too expensive and you need to not hire them. Are you going to sell advanced tickets? The idea with tickets is that you sell them slightly cheaper than the on-the-door price as an incentive to get people to buy them early. So then you have to make less money on the night and your night is less stressful by the amount you've made already, basically. You'll probably need to find someone to act as a doorman for the event. It's a pretty simple job. You just sit there and take money for people and then stamp their hand or draw a symbol on their hand to indicate they've already paid. That person will probably want some kind of payment because it is a pretty boring job. I mean, you could do it yourself, but you kind of want to be able to walk around the venue and just make sure that everything's going well and people are enjoying themselves and there isn't about to be a fist fight between bands because someone's broken someone's amp or something stupid. If you're smart and have some kind of email newsletter, you'll put a sign-up sheet on the door as well, and your doorman will encourage people to put their email address in it as they enter the venue. Maybe you could also have some flyers for any future events you're running. Maybe the bands want to try and sell some CDs as well, or they've got their own flyers. Or maybe you want to try and sell some funny-ass badges as well. These are all things you could do on the door. That, my friends, is basically how to run a live music event. The next episode of Pro Tips, which comes out one month from today on the 10th of September 2017, that episode is going to be all about promoting your event. So now that you know all the logistical management style stuff you need to do, this is strictly how to get people interested and how to get people to turn up to the event. We're going to cover street team promotion with flyers and posters, and we're going to cover digital promotion with social media and that kind of thing. Be sure to subscribe so you know when that video comes out. Be sure to like this video as well. Leave any comments down below and we'll answer them when we can. And I'll see you in a month. Toodaloo. Thanks for watching Pro Tips for Independent Bands, guys. It's great to have you here. There's a variety of buttons below me somewhere right now, including a link to our Patreon creator profile if you feel like giving us money, basically. There's also a link to an episode of Stab Panda Gaming where I play through this really fun band management simulator we found online. Make sure to subscribe to Stab Panda Gaming while you're there as well. Toodaloo!